Thanks so much, Dr. Klimas, for that fantastic talk. And next up, we will be hearing from Dr. Da Dr. David Sistrom from Brigham and Williams Hospital and Harvard Medical School. And we will be hearing about Dr. Sistrom's work looking at the pathophysiology and treatments of exertional intolerance in MECFS. Thank you very much, Andrew, for uh, the kind introduction. Uh, first, a couple of uh, disclaimers. Uh, one, uh, I think you'll do fine with the other you might not like. The first is that I am a lung doctor, go figure, uh, doing ME-CFS. Uh, and the second is that I'm from Boston. This one, you will hold it against me, I know. Um, sorry about that, but we, we can't help it. Um, it's, it's, it's not all bad being from Boston. Um, we don't have a Dr. Angstrom, uh, don't have that in our history, uh, but we did have a Dr. Henderson who did the henderson hasselbeck equation back in the day, and he established this place called the Harvard Fatigue Lab, and it actually put many of the basic tenets of exercise physiology that we now know to be true on the map back in the 20s and the 30s. Uh, over by the Charles River and the Harvard Football Stadium. So here's a table of contents about what I'd like to cover over about 20 minutes. Um, I'd like to tell you about something called an invasive cardiopulmonary exercise test, and it's nice going after Dr. Klimas because uh, it's perhaps related. It is. The basic part of the exercise test is related. What we add with the invasive variety is um, the uh, placement of radial and pulmonary artery catheters before the exercise test. And then they roll around the corner, the patient, from the catheterization lab to the exercise lab, and we get a lot of data. Uh, the way I got into this business as a pulmonologist and critical care doc was initially developing this test at Mass General to detect early heart disease. Uh, early pulmonary vascular disease, but along the way, what we found were patients with un or underexplained exertional intolerance coming to us, many of them ending up with MECFS with a clinical diagnosis. So I think we have something to offer with this test uh, that was developed initially to detect other diseases. So if this works, I'll just show you a little bit in action. Uh, this is in the basement of the Shapiro Building at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, where we do about 10 of these a week for a variety of indications, but over the last three or four years, uh, about half of them for patients with MECFS or variants. Unexplained fatigue, lightheadedness, and dyspnea. Uh, here are some of the key numbers that we get out of this test, and I'll come back to all of these during the course of this. One is non-invasive. That's the maximum oxygen uptake at the end of incremental cycling. Uh, it gives us a gestalt for how ill the patient is. Uh, I will tell you right now, if you're in the business of doing this, many patients with MECFS end up with relatively normal VO2 max. It can be surprisingly normal, 70, 80, 90 percent of predicted. They should not be written off as not having any pathophysiology, as I'll show you in a minute. Uh, two other key things that we get with respect to MECFS. One is the filling pressures, and in particular, the right atrial pressure. That's the filling pressure for the right heart, which we have found to be pretty uniformly abnormally low during incremental upright exercise. And I emphasize upright. If you do this type of exercise supine, you miss the signal. The other one that we have found, and I will discuss here, is the difference between arterial and mixed venous oxygen content at peak exercise. This reflects oxygen extraction in the periphery and the muscle, and we have found it to be abnormal in a majority of cases. So we'll come back to all that. So here's what you should do if you're normal in the green, a little cartoon for VO2 max going up during incremental cycling. And if you're sick, and this could in theory be heart, lung disease, muscle disease, circulatory issues, the VO2 max falls. And our friend, the FIC principle, helps us explain that depressed VO2 max, and this is really where the pulmonary artery and the radial artery catheters come in. We can calculate a FIC cardiac output by measuring the VO2 and then the difference in arterial and mixed venous oxygen content every minute during exercise and at peak exercise. Uh, so then we end up with the determinants of VO2 max. Cardiac output, as you see, is a deficient in some of the patients with MECFS and impaired systemic O2 extraction is the other pattern that we found. 
So this is what they look like. This would be a low flow state, and this is one of the patterns we have found, as you'll see. And this is somebody with impaired systemic O2 extraction where the major abnormality in terms of the VO2 max is impaired systemic O2 extraction. They fail to depress the mixed venous oxygen content. The difference between the two is too high at peak exercise, and there is a, uh, a depressed VO2 peak. Uh, here's a quick example. This is a patient. Um, that this will resonate with some of the patients we have here today. She was, uh, and she's given me uh, permission to discuss some of her uh, personal details. She was a, a cardiology uh, fellow over at Boston Children's. She was a competitive cyclist, and she came to us, Doc, I was fine until I got the flu two years ago. Since then, I've not been fine. And um, she was actually investigated for fatigue and orthostatic intolerance and some dyspnea. About a million dollars spent on her, which is not too unusual, as many of you know. At good hospitals in Boston, no answer. We did a non-invasive test in her view to max was 50%. It should have been 150% as a competitive cyclist. And what she had was low filling pressures. So this is it here, the right atrial pressure in magenta here fails to rise normally during incremental cycling. It should go from about three to 10 millimeters of mercury. There was no hint of augmentation. So based on her and many other patients we saw anecdotally, we uh, did the following published study from two years ago. Uh, it's a little busy here, but what I want you to take away is these are 616 invasive cardiopulmonary exercise tests at the Brigham, and we ruled out everything under the sun first uh, uh, this is pulmonary hypertension, heart failure, inadequate effort, anemia, et cetera. And then what we ended up with were 77 patients. Um, a cadre of them were normal. For all the world, they came to us with uh, symptoms, but we couldn't find anything wrong with them. The VO2 max was normal. The peak cardiac output was normal. And systemic O2 extraction was normal. We used them as a comparator group. And then there was this other very interesting group. These, this was the impaired group. Their VO2 max was less than 80%, but they didn't have the usual reasons for it, heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, lung problems. So we asked the question, what was underlying their impaired VO2 max? And the answer was low filling pressures. And especially at peak exercise, shown here for the right side, the right atrial pressure, and for the left side, this is the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure an index of the left atrial pressure during exercise. This seemed to be the theme that explained the low VO2 max in these patients. We attempted to relate those low filling pressures here, the right atrial pressures, to the impaired VO2 max. The lower it was, the lower the VO2 max. Uh, the lower the left-sided pressures were, the lower the VO2 max. And the mechanism here was largely impaired cardiac output. So we call this preload failure. It's a colloquial term we use in our lab. We then did an interventional um, cohort where we gave acute normal saline boluses in an attempt to get the right atrial pressure up normally uh, at rest on the cycle ergometer, and we asked them to pedal again, and lo and behold, everything was better. So right atrial pressures were better at peak exercise. The wedges were better. The stroke volume response to exercise was better. The cardiac output was better, and the VO2 max was better. So we published this. And, um, went back and retrospectively looked at the demographics of the patients, and most of them had evidence for MECFS. So that kind of got us into this business. So I'm now going to tell you about some exciting new data. Uh, all of this is about to be published, so you're the first to know here. Um, the first one is this, uh, something called small fiber polyneuropathy, which some of you may know. And first, a little special call out to Anne Louise Oaklander, who's here in the audience and whom you'll hear from tomorrow. Uh, neurology at Mass General, a close collaborator with ours. Uh, she has really established this test uh, and established normal fiber density in the epidermis. And if you can see this, there is a little brown thing here, which is the small unmyelinated neurite that innervates the skin, the epidermis, which we sample. Uh, it's a minimally invasive punch biopsy right above the um, medial malleolus. And please note that this little nerve fiber travels with a vein, and it travels with an artery. It also innervates sweat glands, uh, shown over here. So we can sample these things, and Dr. Oaklander expresses them as a uh, centile, uh, basically the nerve density as a centile compared to normals. So the next uh, bit of data is, again, borrowing from our invasive cardiopulmonary exercise test. Uh, this in this case, 1,500 patients, 
in whom we ruled everything else out in the world, identified preload failure as their major problem, and then ruled out the patients who had not, for whatever reason, had a skin biopsy. So we're left with a cadre of patients, 223 patients, who have had a complete invasive CPAP. They don't have anything except preload failure, and they have had an Oaklander skin biopsy uh, performed over at MGH. Here are the demographics for these patients. Uh, there isn't too much important here. I think maybe the medications are uh, semi-important. There is a paucity of things like venodilators, calcium channel blockers, and diuretics, so we don't think those were the answers to the preload failure in most of these patients. Uh, uh, the associated diagnoses will be very near and dear to this group here today. Um, so we went back and uh, interrogated charts and we interrogated patients with IRB approval on the telephone to determine whether they meet the Institute of Medicine definition for MECFS, and the majority does. 72% of these patients I'm about to describe. And then, as all of you know here, major overlap with postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, fibromyalgia, mast cell activation disorder, and many of them gave a history of a sentinel viral infection. What was their exercise phenotype? I'm going to present this slightly differently from that first paper I showed you. Uh, this is a bit different. We Here what we have identified is a high flow uh, and a low flow state. High flow over here on the red, low flow state. And you do that by doing cardiac output slope versus VO2. A normal slope is somewhere around 5 ml, 5 to 6 ml per ml. So this is kind of the middling uh, slope. There's a high slope here and then a low slope, and I'm going to go through the differences between them. Uh, here are the cardiac outputs at peak exercise. One I want to emphasize is that the high flow group, uh, meaning higher cardiac output than expected for level of metabolism, have de facto impaired systemic O2 extraction. They also, there is a hint of lower systemic vascular resistance. So we think some of the arterial resistors perhaps are open in the periphery, and there is a, a high flow, a de facto left to right shunt going on. We know it's not at the level of the heart. It seems to be microscopic. We have uh, data from the resting right heart cath that proves they don't left to right shunt at the level of the heart. And then, as I said, we went back and determined how many of these patients had true MECFS. Uh, the answer is a majority of them. That's here in the red by uh, the Institute of Medicine definition. And then we additionally asked uh, what was the prevalence of small fiber polyneuropathy with Dr. Oaklander's biopsy in this group, uh, shown over here confined to the MECFS group. And the answer is a little better than 40 percent. So the first, uh, I think, perhaps a new notion here that emerges from these data is that there is a high prevalence of small fiber polyneuropathy in MECFS. Uh, this is a frighteningly similar prevalence to things like POTS, that's been published, and fibromyalgia, that's been published. Um, we then additionally attempted to link some of our invasive cardiopulmonary exercise test variables to the nerve density in the skin biopsy. And we're viewing the skin biopsy as a, a view into the interior of the organism. N neurology meets vascular biology. And unfortunately, we didn't find much. Uh, these are all scatter plots. Uh, what we've got here is um, the peak exercise cardiac output, the peak VO2 as a percent predicted, that extraction problem that I mentioned, and the right atrial pressure, the filling pressures. <clears throat> so there's a high prevalence of small fiber polyneuropathy but when we look at the neurite density in the skin, it does not correlate tightly with the exercise pathophys. So I think it's permissive, but it doesn't explain it all. And perhaps, and this is speculation, it's not only the nerves, whether they're there or not, that's the anatomy, but it's the small fibers in their function, which aren't measured, obviously, by a skin biopsy that might be playing a role here. Right, so I'll shift gears here slightly, and I'm going to describe one uh, kind of dedicated pathway that we think has some potential to explain both fatigue uh, in MECFS, but also potentially could have a link with um, the small fiber polyneuropathy whose prevalence is pretty, pretty high here. So uh, something called TRAIL. Uh, I found myself at a meeting here in this lovely city about a year ago, and there was the intramural NIH group here. Uh, Rebecca Fang is here in the audience, and 
Uh, she and I and her colleagues started chattering, chatting, and they had a hypothesis that fatigue and autoimmune disease might be mediated by uh, this uh, pathway. So uh, TRAIL is interesting. Uh, it's a cytokine, as some of you may know, the TNF-related apoptosis-inducing ligand. It's a ubiquitous cytokine uh, secreted from most cells in the body when the body is perturbed. And I'll tell you what it does in a second. Here are some of the things that provoke it. Uh, might be of interest to MECFS because there's a laundry list of viral syndromes that are known to provoke TRAIL. Now, why should TRAIL be uh, linked at all to fatigue? Well, one reason is uh, that there is activation by one of the pathways and two of the TRAIL receptors of NF-kappa-B and the whole pro-inflammatory cytokine that uh, cascade that ensues from those receptors being stimulated or, or um, uh, uh, the ligand with TRAIL. There is also a dummy receptor or a decoy receptor shown over here. This does nothing. It binds TRAIL and therefore tamps down potentially both apoptosis and inflammation. Now, the interesting thing about nerves, and we think this is true both of peripheral nerves and central nervous system, is that they lack the decoy receptor. So this is a potentially neurotoxic pathway uh, that can be stimulated by virus and a variety of other uh, environmental insults. So this paper got our attention. This is the intramural group, Dr. Fang et al., uh, whom I mentioned. They studied this and published this about a year and a half ago. Uh, in the setting of fatigue induced by uh, XRT or radiation therapy. What they were able to do was to show two groups after radiation therapy followed longitudinally. Um, one developed fatigue by a, a questionnaire uh, and cognitive decline, uh, and the other didn't. And what seemed to differentiate the two, at least uh, in some of the measurements they made, was TRAIL. And take a look here just for a second at the concentrations in peripheral blood that they saw. This is 10 picograms per milliliter here in the non-fatigue patients and uh, sort of 30, 35-ish for those who are fatigued. So we uh, got the bright idea <clears throat> that perhaps the acute exercise perturbation uh, that we're doing at the Brigham might provoke trail that had not been published before. Uh, and might play a role in both acute fatigue during exercise, but maybe even post-exertional malaise. So here are those data. Uh, the, this is our group with MECFS undergoing the invasive CPET, and these are trail concentrations uh, measured in arterial blood, uh, not yet mixed venous blood. And there is a bump. This uh, scale is a little deceiving, but there's a significant bump at peak exercise compared to rest, and then one hour into recovery, uh, it disappears. We then asked, uh, could trail bump during exercise at all inform our discussions or our findings about small fiber polyneuropathy? And sadly, there seemed to be no, no difference in the trail bump to acute exercise uh, with, in the green, or without small fiber polyneuropathy. So more on that. We've got lot, many more bloods and normal controls running. Uh, actually, they arrived, um, the assays arrived yesterday here at NIH. <clears throat> Finally, I wanted to give you a little off-label treatment, uh, perhaps tantalizing uh, data, uh, which we're uh, just looking to get published as well. Um, we have had, uh, we have trialed a, a variety of medications in the clinic with MECFS, largely borrowed from the POTS uh, circulation, uh, pot, POTS literature. Blair Grubb in particular has been particularly helpful for us. So uh, one that we have had, uh, not all anecdotally, most luck with is pyridostigmine or mestinon. Uh, this is an FDA-approved drug for myasthenia gravis. Uh, so I'm going to give you a little bit of data <clears throat> of follow-up of patients with non-invasive exercise testing uh, treated with pyridostigmine, and I'll tell you in a minute how I think it might work. So uh, this, these are 62 patients with MECFS and preload failure on the invasive cardiopulmonary exercise test. We took a look at them at baseline with the invasive test and then at about a year out on average with a non-invasive exercise test called Inacore, which allows us to measure VO2 max in a non-invasive rebreathing cardiac output. Uh, and the average mestinon dose was a little bit high, uh, at least compared to uh, the myasthenia indication, 231 milligrams. And uh, here are the pertinent FIC principle variables uh, at baseline and then 
uh, at about one year out on mestinon. Uh, the Inacor gives us the peak VO2, which had improved significantly. And interestingly, more through improved systemic oxygen extraction than by cardiac output. And what we think potentially might be happening here, because this is a cholinergic drug that inhibits the breakdown of acetylcholine at the synapse, is that at the, at the sympathetic ganglion, it may be facilitating adrenergic outflow, in this case, to the arterioles that are dysfunctional, many times associated with small fiber polyneuropathy. So that's essentially what I have for you, just in the way of a quick review. Uh, I gave you two invasive cardiopulmonary exercise phenotypes in MECFS. One is a low flow. Uh, that was the Oldham paper. Uh, gets better if we tank them up and seems to get better to a degree with pyridostigmine. And then the high flow where there seems to be potentially left to right shunting in the periphery. A high prevalence of small fiber polyneuropathy and the linkage between these two things we're still working on. Uh, trail is interesting to us because it's potentially neurotoxic, goes up with acute exercise. We'd love to know ultimately its relationship to small fiber anatomy and function and post-exertional malaise. And, uh, and then finally a bit on treatment. Quick um, uh, future directions. We are keen to know whether this is true left to right shunning in uh, MECFS, but plausible is mitochondrial dysfunction in the limb skeletal muscle. And I know that's a part of the mission of uh, the NIH group addressing MECFS. It is for us as well, and we uh, have just begun to do muscle biopsies uh, in addition to a potential seahorse assay in the blood. Uh, we're keenly interested in knowing how all this, all this acute exercise physiology, pathophys, relates to post-exertional malaise. Really quick shout out to Philip Joseph, who's a fellow at the Brigham. He's commandeered much of this, Rudolph Oliveira, uh, Carlo Rodriguez, Donna Felsenstein, an infectious disease doc at Mass General, Rebecca and Leroy, both here at Intramural MIH, NIH Aaron Waxman, who puts in our PA catheters, and Anne Louise O'Klander, and I thank you very much for your attention. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. That's a great presentation. Thank you. Do you think that the uh, patients that had this high preload, the, the high uh, proportion that you have found has to do with the fact that they were uh, screened through the exercise testing because they had some symptoms, and if you were to do the study in a larger universe without necessarily having symptoms leading to the exercise testing, it would be different. And how do you connect the physiology between the preload failure and the small fiber neuropathy? Right. So um, the, the latter I, I get and is easily answered. The former, maybe we just have to come back to for a second. So um, Dr. Oaklander has taught me, like the little cartoon show, that the unmyelinated small fibers, uh, are, there are different populations physiologically. There are adrenergic and there are actually vasodilatory, some of them through CGRP and they're wrapped around blood vessels, both veins, and so we view that as probably inadequate venoconstriction, priming the pump in the upright position, and then arteries, whose job during exercise are to divert that cardiac output to the mitochondrion in the muscle. The first one I sort of missed, um, the, the first question about symptoms. Yes, so would you extend the findings to patients with MECFS? who will not have the symptoms who would have led them to do the exercise testing. Is the finding of the preload you think is universal for MEC or those who have been yeah. self-selected? So, so it's a really good point. We have certain referral patterns, and by virtue of what I do, uh, those are unexplained exertional intolerance flowing through our system. You're right. So would it be different? I don't think so, honestly, because I haven't found one yet who hasn't had uh, vascular dysregulation with MECFS. Hi, Dr. Tistrom. Thanks for your work. I've actually corresponded with you and Dr. Oaklander. I'm Lily Chu, and thank you for answering some of my emails. My question is, uh, earlier you heard Dr. Berquist talk about um, autoantibodies to uh, muscarinic and adrenergic uh, receptors, and Dr. Skybenborgen from Germany has, has also done the uh, first papers on that. So is there any thought about testing for these autoantibodies in your sample? Right. <clears throat> so we routinely in our 
dyspnea clinic at the Brigham screened the patient for at least a limited number of autoantibodies, including the Mayo Clinic paraneoplastic autoantibody panel. Buried in there, I would say the most frequent hit, and that's probably 10 to 15 percent, is an antibody, um, acetylcholine receptor antibody, comma, ganglionic variety, which is really interesting because it's really myasthenia of the ganglion, and then if mestinon works, maybe we know what we're treating. Uh, and then there are a variety of others as well. I've not done uh, the adrenergic autoantibodies. I'm aware of uh, the work you alluded to, and I think that's probably a great area for collaboration. Sir. Oh. Okay, I'll go. So, um, any correlation between right atrial filling pressures and uh, left ventricular isovolumetric relaxation times in diastole? Um, good question. We don't, we don't have imaging. I would love to have it. Um, we just have pressures during the exercise test. And then a natural thing to do these days would be cardiac MRI, and that's been suggested. But the problem is you put them supine for that, and then yeah. you lose all of this. You have to have gravity in the patient in the upright position to see everything. So um, an echo, of course, is difficult in the upright position sure, during sure. exercise. I just ask because IVRT uh, delays have been uh, published a as a finding in patients with ME-CFS. Okay. No, great thoughts. Thank you. Sir. Uh, very interesting presentation. Thank I'm you. Relatively new to uh, ME-CFS, but was trained in exercise intolerance and chronic disease. And when I first look at this literature, uh, this is circulatory control problem until proven otherwise. And uh, so one of the things that uh, I find needing to be done is normalizing circulation and looking also at one-legged exercise because the, uh, and I'm curious if you've tried to look at that because the, the simplest explanation is actually poor vasoconstriction in the non-active vascular bed, preventing circulation, getting to the exercising muscles. And that is the expl prob prob probable explanation for the low AVO2 difference, which I find somewhat analogous to a wide AA gradient in pulmonary physiology. I agreed with all the above. So yes, our suspicion is that uh, what we are demonstrating is left to right shunting in uh, non-exercising muscle perhaps, but other organ systems like skin and gut, I ag we agree totally. Um, no, f fascinating question, and I think the one-legged exercise would um, give us some read into uh, what is going on. Uh, it's been done in congestive heart failure, it's been done in bad pulmonary disease uh, to look at flow limitation. So great suggestion, thanks. A quick question, David. Uh, so I, I guess uh, any sense of why the kidney doesn't kick in to uh, retain more salt and bring the preload up, and and what would you, and would you what would be the difference in someone who's extremely deconditioned? Right. Um, so in deconditioning, uh, the major hit uh, with the FIC principle is to cardiac output, which in turn is LVEDV. Um, and that's been shown by many groups, uh, both invasively and non-invasively. So this extraction problem and high flow is not a feature of deconditioning. The other question, Walter, was, oh, the kidney. Yeah, so much of what we're describing, of course, is acute exercise. We know in POTS there's a hypovolemic form. Maybe there is an issue there, and there's a neuro neurogenic form. I think we've got a lot of that at least half the time. Um, so great question. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for Dr. Sistrin for presenting such fascinating data.